song that Daniel was playing a little earlier, and we sang about it, It Is Well With My Soul. How many can say tonight, It's Well With Their Soul? You know, it's always easy for us to um, sing in the good times. But I think of the man who wrote that song, Horatio Spafford. He was a man that uh, his family went across the Atlantic. And halfway across the Atlantic, uh, he wasn't on the ship at the time, but the ship sank. And he lost some of his children. His wife made it, and she, she wrote a, a telegram from England or from America saying that the ship had gone down and that a number of his children had been lost. And so the next time he had to get across the Atlantic to go to his wife and the surviving family members, and uh, when they got to the place where the ship had gone down, the captain of the ship that he was on said to him, Mr. Spafford, this is about the place where the ship went down, where you lost some of your family members. And it was out of that experience that he wrote that song, It Is Well With My Soul. Because, you know, it's not always through the good times, but in the bad times, we can experience God's presence as well. And so tonight, um, I don't know if you're ready to hear God's Word. Who's ready to hear God's Word in this place? Amen. It's good to have some noise in the place. So I want to preach a message tonight for a few moments, feeding fires and shaking of snakes. Feeding fires and shaking of snakes. And I want to turn your attention to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 27 and Acts chapter 28. And we're going to read a few more verses tonight than we normally read. But I think it's important for us to get the picture. And, and tonight I want to talk about our progressive walk with God. There is a cycle, there is a progression that needs to happen in our walk with God. Acts chapter 27 and verse 18, uh, to, through to verse 26 and then 28 from verse 1 to 9. And it happens to be talking about a shipwreck as well. It says, the same, the next day, as gale force winds continue to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, even more of the ship's gear was thrown overboard, and a terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars, until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time, but finally Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the Lord, who, who, with whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. Chapter 28, verse 1, it says, Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta, and the people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. And as Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. Verse 5 says, but Paul shook off the snake into the fire, and he was unharmed. Verse 7 says, near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Piblis, the chief official of the island, and he welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. And as it happened, Piblis's father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him, laying his hands on him, and he healed him. Then all the other sick people of the island came, and they were healed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for a moment. Father God, tonight I just take, I thank you for your word. Thank you that your word brings life. Thank you tonight we can say without a shadow of a doubt, it is well with our soul. And that, Father, you have something to say to us in this message tonight. I pray, Spirit of God, that you would speak to us, speak to the inner recesses of our heart. I pray for Holy Ghost conviction that those who do not know you tonight would respond to your message, and those who do would walk further in their walk with you tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask it, and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. I want to preach tonight, as I said a moment ago, feeding fires and shaking off snakes. You know, we expect progress in everything in life. We expect something to happen when something starts off small, we expect it to grow. We expect when we put uh, seeds into the ground that they will grow and that we'll have fruit from them. 
We expect children to grow from little helpless babies to mature adults, and I'm sure that the family in the front of us here, the Joseph family, would believe that as well, that as their little one grows, one day their little one will become a very big person, and they will go through life. And we expect this. We expect the milestones, not that kind of growing, the tall growing, okay? There are milestones that we are able to mark along the way. And as a child grows through certain stages, we look for those milestones, we look for those markers. But you know, the most tragic cases are those where children have suffered from developmental arrest. It might have happened through abuse or through neglect. And I've always been interested in this subject. I remember reading about these eight children who were confined in three foot tall cages. They were held in these cages on the second floor and in fact, the, the people that looked after them, if you call that word looking after, had rigged the cages with alarms that would signal downstairs if the cages were open. But they were held in these cages for many, many, many years. What about the mother who kept her children locked away, her three daughters locked away for seven years? These girls, uh, when they found them, they said it was the most indescribable filth that these seven, these three girls had lived in. For seven years, they had never seen the daylight. They had never seen the light. They had never felt fresh air on their, on their body. But they were held as prisoners, as it were. Their mother and father had got divorced. And as a result of that, the mother had said, well, I'll take the children out of school, and I will homeschool them. Except she didn't homeschool them. What she did was she put them into, these, uh, into this place locked away. And it's interesting that, 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 that when they found these children, these three girls, they talked about their physical and social, physical and, and psychosocial development had, was catastrophic. There had been so much damage done to these three girls. They had hid, in fact, when they found them and they brought them out into the light, the girls almost uh, tried to scutter away into a dark place because they had only lived in darkness. They had played with mouse in the darkness. They couldn't endure light. The very sad part is also is that as they, as they came out, they were not able to speak. There had been this, this arresting of their development. The one girl, 21 years of age now, they, the, the, the psychologist said she was so disturbed as she would stand on one leg for hours upon hours just looking at the ground. Developmental arrest in children. It's that failure to reach the normal and the expected milestones of growth. When I look at teenagers in this place, I would expect that a teenager wouldn't act like a three-year-old. We expect them sometimes, parents. I'm not sure about that sometimes. <laughs> but we do expect progress. We expect them to go through the stages of life. We expect them to become healthy people in the future of life and become contributing members of society. There is this progression that takes place. We expect it in all aspects of life. And I want to say tonight that the Christian life is a progressive walk with God. There is a starting point and there is a progressing point. There is a moving on in God. In fact, the Bible uses in Romans chapter 117, it says, from faith to faith. We move from faith to faith. There is a moving in our faith. There is a time when we have weak faith. There is a time when we have simple faith, but we start growing in our faith. I think of Abraham when, when, you know, as, as he left the era of the Chaldees, I don't believe the faith he had at that moment was the same faith that he had when he stood up with the knife in his hand as he was about to sacrifice his son. There was a change that took place in his faith. In the beginning, had God come to him at that first moment and said, Abraham, I'm introducing myself to you. You're going to go to the place and I'm going to get to the place where you're going to sacrifice your son. I don't believe he could have made that decision then. But as he walked with God, as there was this progression of faith that took place in his life, he was able to come to that place knowing the confidence that he could have in God. There was a progression in his walk with God. And, and I see it in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed God when he called him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10 says, Abraham was confidently looking forward. Can you see that progression taking place? Hebrews eleven seventeen. by faith, Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice as he received the promises of God. In Hebrews eleven nineteen, 19, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. 
He could stand on this progression of faith. He was able to move from one faith to another faith. And I believe tonight that there is a moving that God wants to take place in your life. If you've been a child of God for a one week or two weeks or 10 years or 20 years, there is a progression that needs to take place in our walk with God. Turn to the person next and say, you've got to progress in God. I believe that's what, what Abraham, he could stand, and that, that word stand simply means he was rooted, he was confident and stable in the fact that God is able. He was able to know that God could do things for him. I love, I love what it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, from glory to glory, not just from faith to faith, but there is this moving from glory to glory. Ephesians chapter 4.11 says, until we become to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Wherever you are in your walk with God tonight, God's not finished with you yet. You're not at the finish point. God doesn't bring you into the kingdom so that you sit around, but he wants you to grow and move on in him. There is this progression that takes place. I love what Paul says, and he talks about this progression in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. And he goes on to talk about there is the standing place, first of all, and then there is the sitting place, and then there is this walking place. There is this progression that takes place. When I think about the standing, you know what? We simply stand upon the promise that God made for us. As we come into the kingdom of God, that first day that we responded to the message of Jesus Christ, we stand on the promise because we can do nothing for salvation. We simply come as we are. There's nothing you can bring to the table with God except yourself. You bring yourself to the table and say, God, I've got nothing to offer but my sin. And God says, I'll take care of your sin and I'll make you a child of mine. He takes you out of the kingdom of darkness and puts you into the kingdom of light. There is that progression, there's that standing tonight that we can know that if God has taken away our sin, do you believe that tonight? He has taken away our sin. There is that standing, but we don't just stand in God. The Bible says that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. In Ephesians chapter two, verse six, and then Ephesians five, five, it says not only are you seated, but you now begin to walk in God. So there's this progression. Turn the person next to you and say, there is this progression in God. You see, being born again is your first step with God. I believe it's our introduction 101. It's that first moment. For some of you tonight, I'm believing, and I don't know about you, but I've sensed God's presence through the service tonight. As we were worshiping, worship brings us to that place. There's some of you that maybe you've come to church for the first time tonight. There may be, you've been coming to church for many years, but you haven't never made that personal decision with Christ. I want to tell you tonight, he's in this place for you. He's in this place ready to receive you with open arms. He wants you to move on in his walk. Our Christian walk is a progressive walk. As I looked at the chapters 27 and 28 of Acts, I see a progression that takes place. And Paul begins to bring this thing to our mind. And I want to just bring out the five points tonight of this progression. In Acts chapter 27, we start off, it says the number one point I want to bring out, it starts with a storm and a shipwreck. It starts with a storm and a shipwreck. And I don't know how many people in this, in this place tonight, your Christian life started with a storm and a shipwreck. It started with, you know what, God didn't get your attention until you ran aground. God never got your attention until things got messed up in your life. You came with damaged goods. You came destroyed. There was no thought of God until there was a storm. Anybody in this place can say, that's me. A storm. Not only just a storm, but a shipwreck. You know, some of, for, for some of you, your life was going quite calm. Uh, your life was ordered, and all of a sudden, some chaotic thing happened in your life that, was, that almost spun you out. But that was the moment when you came to know God. That was the moment at times when your back was to the wall. You had no more resources of your own. You were no longer able in your own self to meet your own needs, and you called out to God. I remember back in South Africa in the army days when, when we had people that would go to the border, and I remember how many times we've heard, and you would have heard it if you had people that were in the, in, in the army in, the, in those years, that when they were in crisis, they'd be praying out and making promises to God, making promises, God, if you just get me out of this place, I'll serve you. But you know what, when the things went good, they forgot about God. Anybody know people like that? I remember hearing many people like that. They'd make promises to God when on the border, when their life was that close to being taken. 
But as soon as they got back to calm waters, they forgot about the promises that they made. But I want to say tonight that it starts out sometimes like a storm and a shipwreck. I think of the prodigal son. He lived in the comfort of his father's home. He went out, but it was only when he got to the pigsty. It was only when he was eating the same food as the pigs that the Bible says he came to his senses and he realized, this is not the place for me. He came to a shipwreck in his life. He came to the place when he was no longer able to sit where he was. And he said, I have a father who loves me. I have somebody that cares for me. And he made his way towards the father. I was reading just the other day of Steve McQueen, that iconic actor of many years ago. And, and reading about his story, it tells us, and, and they, they were telling about the fact that he got cancer, and we know that from, from the life story. But at the moment that he got the cancer, they, they found that it had already gone too far. And he began to question his life. He had this life, he had a life filled of, of money, he had all the things that he wanted in life, but at this moment there was a storm, this moment there was a crisis. And he wanted to find out, he started thinking about things other than himself. And they tell us in the story that he, he got hold of Billy Graham. I don't know about you, but I love Billy Graham. I love Billy Graham. Billy Graham flew down to California and was able to share with him. And that night, Steve McQueen responded to the gospel. There was a storm in his life. There was a shipwreck in his life. And he came to the place where he made right with God. You know, storms seem to get some people moving. You know, thank God there are people that just come without the storms, but a lot of us come through the storms. A lot of us come when there's shipwrecks in our life. I don't know if maybe tonight you, you came because you had a shipwreck of a marriage. You might have had a shipwreck of a business, shipwreck of health. Something went wrong in your life, and you responded to the message. The second thought I have is in Acts chapter 28, verse 1. It says, once we were safe. And you know what? For, for people that have come to know Jesus, he is safety. I tell you what, Jesus brings safety to our lives. And this is what it says here. You know what? They lost their stuff, but they were safe. The Bible says they're thrown off all the stuff. And sometimes it's the stuff that's keeping us from God. It's the stuff that has kept us from God for so long. It's been our securities. It's been our things that we've held on to. But once the shipwreck has taken place, once the storm has taken place, and those things are taken out, you know what? That's the time people have moved towards God. But it says here, we were safe. I want to say tonight that God's not interested in your comfort as much as your eternity. He's not interested in how comfortable you are in this world. I know that we love to be comfortable, but you know what? God wants your attention. God wants you in the place because, the, you know what? We, we can live here for 60 years, 90 years, 100 years. 100 years in comparison to eternity is but a drop in the bucket. It comes and it goes. How many people sitting here tonight, you might be in your 60s and 70s, you remember when you were a young person, you talked about all the dreams that you had for your life, and how quickly your life has gone. You think, well, where did those 40 years go? Where did those 60 years go? Life is but a short moment. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. But you know what? God's not interested in our comfort. He wants to make sure our eternity is right and that we're growing with Him. Safe. They were safe on the shore. I remember in Sunday school days, and you might remember it, there was a song we used to sing, if you're saved and you know it, say amen. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. You know, a lot of people get saved, but they never move on with God. A lot of people can be singing that song tonight, I'm saved and I'm happy, but that's all you are, saved. God wants you to move beyond 101 saved. He wants you to move on and grow with him. He wants you to move into his walk with him. For some people, it's become arrested development in your Christian life. You're not moving on with God tonight, arrested in your spiritual life. God's got more than simply being saved and right with Him. He wants you to move on and grow up with Him. You see, the ultimate goal that God has for us is that we become like His Son. He's wanting people, He's looking for people in this place that will become like Jesus to their neighborhood. He's looking for people that would become like Jesus to their workplaces. He's looking for people like Jesus who would show Jesus to their, their, their friends and neighbors. Because when people look at you, they shouldn't be seeing you, but seeing Jesus in you. That's what he's looking for, coming to that full maturity, that image of his son, that as people look at you, say, what have you got? There's something in your life that I can't put my finger on, but there's something in your life that's, that's different. That's what God wants to do in your life tonight. Safe. I wonder tonight if you're just at that place of safe. But I love what Paul does over here. He goes beyond just being safe. He goes beyond the shipwreck and the storm. 
he goes to number three, where he begins to feed the fire and shake off the snakes. It says there in verse three, and Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire. A poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. Paul did not sit idle by the fire. But the Bible tells me that he gathered a bundle of sticks for the fire. You see, as Pentecostals, and I've been a Christian this year, next month, for 37 years. 37 years ago, I was a boy of 14 years of age when, when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been a Pentecostal church from those many years. And I know how often we sing about the fire. Send us the fire, Lord. Keep the fire burning. Those are the songs we sing. But I want to say tonight, we need to bring some sticks to make the fire burn. There are some sticks that we got to put into the fire. We can sit around and sing the songs until the cows come home. The fire will not burn. It needs some sticks to be put into that fire tonight. Amen? We need to bring them in so that we can enable that fire to burn. I think of some of the sticks tonight, maybe the sticks of our witness to others. What kind of witness do we have? Are you putting the sticks of your witness into the fire? Because when people look at you, do they see Jesus or do they see the old man? Do they see the same person who swears just like he used to swear? Do they see the same person who walks in the same places that he used to walk? Jesus says tonight, I'm looking for some sticks of witness. Because that world out there will never come to know him if we live just like them. They want to see somebody who lives different from them. Because I tell you that when, you, when, they, when they're in trouble, they're looking for people that know God. They're looking for neighbors that know God. I ask you, does your witness confirm the gospel of Jesus or does it deny it? Can you say tonight, I bear witness to God in this place? What about the sticks of our testimony? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. I love what it says in the book of Revelation. They overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. I'm asking you tonight, is your testimony about the new life in Christ? If it's not, it's time to move on. It's time to move into this new life with God. We need to start putting the sticks of our witness into the fire. Put the sticks of our testimony into the fire. Because that world out there is a cold world, friend. They need people that are alive with God. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to come to church just to have another meeting. I want to come to meet with God. I want to move on with God. I want to grow on with God. Amen. What about the sticks of our talents? Thank God for people that are using their talents. Do you know your talents can bring people to the fire of God? Your talents, man, it doesn't matter what it is. You're just saying, God, I'm bringing it tonight. I've got stuff that I can use for the kingdom of God. God doesn't only need preachers. God doesn't only need singers. He needs people like you that have got talents tonight. Bring your bundle of sticks to the fire. What about the sticks of faith tonight? Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I believe tonight God is looking for people that will have reckless faith. He's looking for people that have igniting faith. People that have faith that says, I believe God no matter what. That's the kind of faith God is looking. He's not looking for insipid faith. He's not looking for faith that just kind of runs with the, what, you know, he says, I want faith that says, I believe God in this situation. If you're sick, I believe God can heal you. He's looking for people tonight to say, if you're bound, God says, I can heal you. God can bring you out. Sticks of faith. What about the sticks of boldness? It's moving beyond being safe and just saved. Are you expecting in this place that the fire will burn because of your boldness? Maybe tomorrow morning as you get to work, we're saying, God, I need some boldness to begin to speak your word. I need some boldness to stand up for you. We're not like the world. We're different. The Bible says you're in the world, but you're not of this world. There's a difference that takes place in our lives. A boldness. What about the sticks of passion? You know, any fire needs something to constantly fuel it. But maybe tonight those flames have died out. Maybe there's just white ash around the place. You, you know, you've come to church for 20 years. You've come to church for 30 years. But that fire has gone tonight. God says, bring back the fire. Bring back the passion tonight. Passion that leads to action. It's making our lives count for God and his cause. Those are the fire feeders tonight, my friend. God's looking for you tonight. You know, you don't have to wait for certain positions of authority. You don't have to wait until you get to a certain place. God will use you where you are. Tomorrow morning in your workplace, God's looking for his voice in that place. God's looking for his voice. But you know, maybe tonight you're saying, well, I'll do it when. Every time we say, I'll do it when, we're kind of smoldering the fire away. We need to be putting the fire of God into the place. 
Somebody once said, if you aspire to just have a nice home and a nice car and a nice family, then you'll have wasted your life. God created you for more. Don't waste your life. Is he saying it's wrong to have the nice car and nice family? No. But he's saying if that's all our life is, I tell you what, just like the buildings, just like the buildings that Katrina was talking about, they'll come and they'll go. But the things of God stay forever. Amen? Amen. They're forever. What, is it, what, what does it take? I believe it's, it's what's found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1. It says, offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice is that it's quite easy for it to jump off the altar. It, it can at any time, it's our choice tonight. God, I'm going to serve you. God, I'm going to get passionate about you. God, I'm going to put those sticks of boldness and faith into the fire tonight. I want to see the fire of God burn in my life. How many want to see God's fire burn in their life tonight? Man, God's talking to you tonight. Paul was building a fire. He had a passion in him. But you know what? He got attacked when he was doing something. I say to you tonight, feed the fire. Turn the person next to you and say, feed the fire. It tells us that as he was feeding the fire, a snake came out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. I want you to listen to this tonight. You know, any time, anything that you do for God is going to get the enemy's attention. When you decide to do something positive for God and make a move towards God and begin the progression, you are going to get the enemy's attention. The devil doesn't mind clinical, cold, callous religion. He doesn't mind us coming to church week in and week out if we're not going to be hot for God. He doesn't mind us sitting here every week. But when you start getting passionate about God, when you start getting on fire for God, when you start putting the sticks into those fires and they begin to burn, that's when the fire causes the enemy to arise. But I love what Paul says here. He began to kindle those fires. He began to stir those fires. He added fuel to the fire. And as a result of that, that's when the snake took a hold of him. But I love what the Bible says. He simply shook off the snake. Turn the person next to him and say, shake off the snake. Because without fire, there's no gospel. Without fire, there's no walk with God. I tell you what, there's nothing worse than seeing a person who's been on the road for 30, 40 years, and they look like they've been there for 30, 40 years. I believe that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. I believe that every day that we walk with God is a fresh encounter with God. Every time you open the Word of God, it's a fresh encounter. I'm not talking about something that happened 37 years ago. I need God today. I need Him today, not yesterday, but today. Amen? Shake off the snake. What kind of snakes have you got in your life? Maybe it's the snake of fear. Maybe it's the snake of failure. Maybe it's the snake of past hurts. And all we talk about is our past hurts. We talk about those strongholds. I tell you tonight, shake off the snake. Feed the fire and shake off the snake. I don't know what kind of snakes have attached themselves to you tonight, but I believe tonight God's in this place to break the snakes, to kill the snakes, to destroy the snakes. Amen? He wants us to shake off the snakes. And the last point I want to bring, and I'm, I'm ready. We need to walk in the supernatural. Look what happened to Paul. He was shipwrecked, but he found himself in a safe place. But he moved beyond that place. He began to feed the fire, and as a result of the feeding of the fire, the snake got a hold of him, but he shook it off. And I love what happened. That was part of his witness, because those people on the island of Malta were looking at him and said, you know, he must have been a murderer. Bad things happen to bad people. But I tell you what, I don't care what you've gone through. I don't care what the devil's throwing you away. Tonight, you can shake off the snake. Paul shook off the snake, and as he shook off the snake, their eyes opened because they were waiting for him to die, but he didn't die. How many know tonight that when you're on God's side, you don't die? You move on with God, amen? Listen to what it says. As he walked, he began to walk in the, in the supernatural. I believe tonight that God wants to manifest his presence through you. You are not saved just to sit, but to do the greater works of God. Look what it says in Acts 28, verse 7 to 9. It says, And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hand on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and they were healed. Satan wants to take you out so that the greater works of God are limited, diminished, extinguished, made of null and void in your life. Maybe tonight you need to start shaking some snakes off. Shake them off. Feed the fire tonight. 
Because this is what it says in Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. In my name, turn the person next to you say, in his name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 10, verse 19 says, I give you authority to stamp, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. I'm saying tonight, folks, this is not for the elite of the church, but this is for every believer. God wants us to move on. He wants us to move on our progression. Paul wasn't sitting in a church when this happened. He was out in the fields. I'm saying tonight that God's looking for people that will take his power into the streets. God's looking for people that will take it into the war zones, into the marketplaces, into the hospitals, into the homes, into the neighbors. Anywhere where people are snared, he's looking for people that will take his fire and take his power into those places. He gives us authority. Because the supernatural is the natural with God. The supernatural is the natural for God. We jump around and say, whoa, that was supernatural. God says, that's normal for me. We look at the extraordinary and say, that's amazing. God says, the extraordinary is just the ordinary for me. I want to say tonight, that's what God wants. He wants us to take with us his authority, his power. He wants us to move out, feed the fires, shake off the snakes, and begin to walk in the supernatural tonight. God doesn't want us just to be a typical believer. In John chapter 14, verse 12, he who believes in me, How many believe in him tonight? The works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these you will do because I go to the Father. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a typical believer. A typical believer just visits God on the weekends. A typical believer can go through their whole life never touching another life for God. I don't even want to go to a typical church. A typical church is the place that most people have never encountered God or experienced his presence. It's just a drudgery, it's a dormant, uh, a, a passive experience. We walk in, we pay our dues to God, and we get out. No, I want to be in a place where there's fire. I want to be in the place where God's moving. I want to be in the place where God does miraculous things, and that we see the encounterings of God in our place. I believe that we're in this place. I don't want to be in the typical church, because the typical church does church, but the Bible says we are the church. I want to be the church. I want to be his hands and feet that as I move out, I can touch the sick and they can be healed. Not because of who I am, but because I'm a child of God, a believer washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Come on now. I don't know if you're hungry and thirsty for that fresh move of God in this place. I don't know if you've got a place of dissatisfaction. You know, we're not dissatisfied with what God's done, but God's got more. I don't know if you're in this place tonight where you're desperate. I'm asking you tonight, are you ready for God to pour out his spirit upon you, to change you and take you beyond your natural limitations? I don't care what they are. You might be a timid person. I was timid. I was the kind of person who played one man chess, one hand against the other hand. I wouldn't tell which hand's going to win because I couldn't stand up in front of people. But when I got full of the Holy Ghost, God did something in my life. God can take simple, quiet, reserved people and he can make them loud mouths. Paul was doing the natural things when ministering to the sick. They were not the supernatural. In his mind, this is what God does. In his mind, God does these things. Do you believe that God can do these things? Do you believe that he's alive? Do you believe he's in this place tonight? Amen. Acts chapter 19, I'm nearly finished. Acts chapter 19, verse 11, it says, they took handkerchiefs off his body and placed them on the sick and they were healed. Acts 14, verses 8 to 10, the Bible says that he healed a cripple from birth. Through the power and through the Bible, we read of God's miraculous power as it's manifested and displayed through the church. I tell you what, we're still living in the church age. There's some that will tell you, well, you know, these things are finished. No, God's not finished yet. He's only finished when he's finished, and he's never finished, amen? He's on the move all the time. Acts chapter 5, verse 16, it says, they were all healed. Turn the person who said, all healed. Acts chapter 3, Peter walked in the supernatural. He healed the sick cast out demons, raised the dead, delivered people out of prison supernaturally. What about Stephen? He was just a lay person. He wasn't the qualified pastor in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, but the Bible says he was full of faith. That's all it takes, my friend. It takes faith as you take that stick of faith into the fire and say, God, I believe that you can do it. That's all that Stephen did. And the Bible says that 
the power. He did great wonders and signs amongst the people. A supernatural manifestation is needed for situations that can't be met by natural means. And I don't know how many people you know that are not able in their own self to meet their needs, but God can meet them for them. I'm asking you tonight, do you really expect God's power to be released in your life? I want the musicians to come forward right now as we bow our heads in prayer. Feeding the fire, shaking off the snakes. I'm really believing tonight that God's going to encounter us in this place. I want to talk to two different groups of people. I want to talk first of all to those of you that maybe your life is in shipwreck right now. Your life tonight, you're in a storm. And things are not really working out. You might have been religious all your life, but you know you're not right with God. You know you're not right with God. But in this place tonight, He wants to encounter you. The Bible says that there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. It doesn't come through religion. Religion is merely man's search for God. It comes through a person, a living person, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells me that he took our hand. He took the hand of God as he stretched himself out on a cross and gave his life. And as he gave his life, he brought us together. But the choice is tonight, do you put your hand in his hand so that he can introduce you to the Father? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. There's nothing big and fancy about that. It's very simple. I believe. I believe the story that Jesus died on the cross for me. I admit that I'm not right with God, but I believe that story. I believe it. It's not just a story. It's a historical fact. I believe it. And tonight, I choose Him to be my Savior. I choose Him to change my life. I'm going to talk to you first of all. If you're in this place, I believe that the Spirit of God has been convicting. You feel that pumping in your heart. God is speaking to your heart. I want to pray with you tonight. I will not embarrass you, but I want to pray with you tonight. Would you just put your hand up where you are in this place? You say, that's me. You know, my life's been a shipwreck. I've gone through the storms, but I do need, I'm experiencing, I want God to help me. I need God. I need God. God bless you. God bless you. I will not embarrass you. Just put your hand up where you are. We want to pray with you tonight. Anybody else here? God bless you. Somebody on that side over there. God bless you. Anybody else here tonight? God is in this place. He's moving. God bless you. God bless you. There's somebody else over there. Anybody else here tonight? You're saying tonight, that's me, Shane. My life is shipwrecked. But I need to be safe. I need to find him. I need to find him. You can put your hand up. Just put it up where you are and take it down. Anybody else here tonight? Anybody else here tonight? Then I'm going to ask, I'm going to talk to Christians for a moment. You're safe. Maybe tonight you're at the beginning of the cycle. You're safe. But God wants you to move on. He wants you to start feeding the fires. He wants you to start shaking off some of those snakes that have been holding onto you for too long. The, the snake of fear. The snake of defeat. All those snakes, you know what they are that are holding onto you. And he wants you to walk in the supernatural. I want to pray for you tonight. Anybody in this place, you say, that's me, Shane. You know what? I want to move on with God. Just quickly put your hand up in this place. I believe tonight that God is going to do some awesome, powerful things in your life. But he needs you to make the first step. That's me. I'm moving on with God tonight. Just put your hand up where you are quickly. Put your hand up all over this place. All over this place. God is speaking to your life. Then we're going to do this tonight. If you haven't, if you haven't raised your hand, I want to ask those people that uh, put your hand up said, yes, my life's shipwrecked. My, I've been in the storm, but tonight I'm going to come to the safety of the Father. At the same time that these other people that raised hands, you want to come. I'm believing tonight. We're going to pray for you tonight. I know we're running a bit of time, but I want us to pray tonight. I believe tonight that God's going to do something in your life. You know what? I believe tonight's going to be a life-changing moment in your life, your Christian life. You're going to look back and say, this was a night that God moved in my life. I want you to quickly come forward right now. Come and stand. And as you come to the front, just put your hands up in the air as if you're saying, God, this is me. I'm beginning to surrender. I'm surrendering tonight. I don't care where you are in the cycle. 
come up to the front as we believe God to do something powerful in your life tonight. You need to start feeding. Maybe there's some things you've got to put into the fire to start igniting that fire tonight. Maybe tonight you've got to start shaking off some of the snakes. Maybe tonight you just need to say, God, I want to start walking in the supernatural. I want to see God's power move in my life. You are the person that God is moving. Just quickly come to the front. We just have some people come and help us quickly for a moment. I don't want any spot, uh, spectators here. I'm looking for participators. I'm looking for people that say, God, tonight it's you and me. This is a moment in the divine encounter with you tonight. Then I'm going to ask everyone else in this building to stand up right now. And I'm going to ask you, because you are believers. I'm taking it tonight as you sit back that night, you are believers, that you are walking in the supernatural, that you are encountering God, that, that you have all these things happening. That's fantastic. I want you to put your hands out towards these people right now. Thank God there are people still coming out. You can still come out. You feel God speaking. Come out. Just come out quickly and let's begin to believe God to do some supernatural things in your life tonight. Then the rest of us, I'm going to ask you, if you feel the Holy Spirit, begin to speak in that other language. Speak in those tongues right now as we begin to make this place a noisy place of praise. Because the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of His people. That as we begin to praise God, we, we make the atmosphere where God is able to move. And that's what we're experiencing right now. We're believing God tonight. We are believing God tonight. I'm going to ask all the pastors to come as we pray. First of all, we're going to pray for those tonight that have never received Christ. And I'm going to ask everybody in this building to pray this prayer with us tonight. Because as we pray it, we're going to pray and help these people tonight. And then we're going to pray for those that are standing here tonight, believing God for some divine encounters, believing God that they are feeding the fires, that there is some encountering taking place with God tonight over here. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We admit, I admit, that I'm not right with you, that my life is shipwrecked, that I've been in the storms, but tonight, I want to be safe in your arms. I want to be safe in the arms of Jesus. I admit that I'm not right with you, but I believe that Jesus, you died on the cross, that you stretched out on the cross to take my hand and God's hand and bring us together. Tonight, I choose Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I look beyond the shipwreck and I step onto the safe shores of your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Father God, tonight, as people have their hands raised here tonight, they are wanting to encounter you in a powerful way. People are wanting to feed their faith, feed the fires. They want to feed the fires tonight. And I pray right now, Spirit of God, we're sick and tired of being tired and sick. We're sick and tired of just walking as, as miserable Christians. But tonight, we come with a boldness. We come with authority. And we say in the name of Jesus, we begin to stoke those fires. We begin to feed the fires. We put in those sticks of faith tonight. We put in the sticks of boldness. We put in the sticks of our witness and our testimony. And we say, my God, in the name of Jesus, we feel the fire in our hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, as those snakes have taken a hold of us, we shake off the snakes tonight in the name of Jesus. We shake off that snake of sickness. We shake off that snake of, the, of, of, of demonic power. We shake those snakes off in the name of Jesus Christ. We bind those things in the name of Jesus. And we begin to walk in the supernatural tonight. I pray for supernatural encounters. I pray for divine encounters tonight. I pray, God, right now in the name of Jesus, that as we lay hands, we begin to lay hands on these people, that the power of God will begin to move and manifest in their lives right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, folks, let's begin to praise God. Let's begin to praise God as these people get prayed for for a few moments right now.